Thank you very much. Uh, I'm very happy to uh, have the opportunity to present the work that we have been doing for the past uh, six, seven years uh, in, in collaboration with Harsha Bats uh, group. Um, so my talk will focus on an overview of work that has been conducted by both Kurama uh, Okubo, Dr. Okubo is in the National Research Institute uh, for Earth Science and Disaster Resilience in Japan, and uh, by Dr. Carlos Villafuerte, who is currently doing a postdoc at ENS. Um, so the, we have three main parts of the talk. The First part, I'll introduce the use of the combined finite discrete element method for the simulation of earthquake ruptures. Uh, the second part, uh, I'll uh, show some work that Kurama did on the modeling of the Kaikura earthquake that happened in 2016. And finally, uh, I'll touch on the work that is ongoing in, at ENS right now on the modeling of trust faults. So uh, the work that Kurama was uh, conducting during his PhD and also after he obtained his degree was uh, to study what happened with the co-seismic of fall damage uh, when we have a, a, a rupture that is uh, propagating in the rock medium. And also how, how important is the role that uh, that damage outside the fault plays in earthquakes. So uh, the, when we started with this, uh, the problem was uh, posed as uh, the challenge of describe, uh, obtaining a numerical technique to describe the cause seismic of, of fault damage. And uh, based on that, since uh, at the lab here, we had developed the combined finite discrete element method implementation um, for other applications, but we saw that there were uh, many features of the method that could very well be applied to the study of uh, earthquake rupture. So we developed uh, uh, in collaboration with Kurama and Harsha, but, a, a numerical framework to, to do that. And uh, based on that numerical framework, we uh, evaluated the effects of the co-seismic damage on rupture dynamic, radiation, and overall energy budget. I'll cover the first two, rupture dynamics and radiation. For the overall energy budget, uh, people can refer to Kurama's uh, thesis and also to a JGR paper where uh, there is a very good uh, explanation of, of that part. Um, and then, yeah, we'll, we'll talk about the Kaikura earthquake uh, and how, how we simulate it and uh, some interesting conclusions uh, that we obtain. So the method was originally developed by Munjisa in the uh, 1990s. It was proposed by him. And uh, as the name says, it's a combination of the finite element and the discrete element method. The finite element is a, a Lagrangian finite element uh, that we are using to describe uh, stress as a function of deformation, as in a traditional sense. And the discrete element part comes uh, to this, into the description of the interfaces uh, and fractures and fragmentation. So the method allows, uh, so we have a, a standard uh, triangular mesh, let's say in 2D, and we uh, can describe uh, the interfaces uh, with the discrete element techniques, uh, by imposing friction laws, for example, in this case, the, the main black line, horizontal black line uh, indicates the presence of a fault. And on that fault, we can establish the friction law as the one that is shown on the right hand side. On the medium itself, we establish uh, 
cohesion laws that uh, describe the failure of material both in tension and in shear. Uh, the analysis that we are presenting here, uh, we consider that the material inside the finite elements stays as elastic and the plastic processes uh, concentrates on the failure of the interfaces. Uh, so that's one feature of um, the combined finite discrete element implementation is that the fractures or the failure is allowed to happen along the interfaces of the uh, finite elements. So uh, we have to be cognizant of that and also pay attention to the mesh uh, generation so we don't end up with a system that um, could artificially drive uh, damage in a certain direction due to, to mesh uh, bias. So uh, in the in the simulation of the earthquake rupture, yeah, we have a, a, a stress concentration area. And once you know the material outside the fault, so in the medium, reaches a point where the, the stress is equal to the strength, then we start on a path of a, a strain softening, which is this curve indicated on the left-hand side graph. And when the strain softening process is finished, we have a fully developed fracture, which is indicated by the blue lines in the diagram. As the fault continues to propagate forward, the uh, fracture or uh, damage is uh, generated as a consequence of, of the interaction between the stress radiation uh, area and the medium. So these are dynamically activated fractures that were not there obviously before the simulation started. And uh, those fractures have on top of the cohesive uh, law that we are showing on the left hand side, we, uh, we also have a frictional law similar to um, what is shown on the right hand side. So this is an animation of an earthquake rupture that uh, uh, will uh, show how the process that we indicated pictorially in the previous slide is actually demonstrate uh, uh, calculated in the simulation so the, the fracture the rupture is starting to run and as a consequence of that we have it, uh, the stress concentration propagating uh, together with the rupture and behind behind the rupture we see the damage uh, that uh, is created as a consequence of the material reaching the the strength levels um this damage also uh, affects the radiation created by the, the earthquake uh, rupture. And we'll talk about that more in detail in the following slides. So, okay, so we can identify uh, different uh, areas, for example, this white lines are the failed interfaces that we call the off-fault fracturing uh, uh, or off-fault damage. And uh, we, we see as a, a consequence of the formation of this uh, off-fault damage that the radiation area in this, the radiation uh, features in this area are uh, very heavily uh, affected by that. And yeah, that's a high frequency radiation coming from that of fall damage. And the overall energy budget is also going to be affected, obviously, because we don't have only the energy that is being dissipated on the main fault, but we have also the energy that is being dissipated in creating all these new interfaces in the medium. So the Kurama conducted a very nice uh, analysis, in-depth in analysis of the tensile crack areas and the shear crack areas. 
And uh, these are two snapshots where we are showing the, the position of the rapture zone. And behind the, the rapture zone, we have a, a collection of uh, failed interfaces. Some of them are uh, failing in tensile, which are indicated by the left-hand side graph. And some of them are failing in shear, which are indicated by the right-hand side graph. Um, as yeah, as we mentioned earlier, the cracks are activated before the rupture tip, and we can analyze uh, the direction of the uh, mode one or tensile cracks, and the mode two or shear cracks, uh, which in this case we have a pole around the 60 degrees uh, with respect to the uh, default. Um, and for the shear crack, we have two poles. One is uh, around 40 degrees and the other one is uh, in between 90 and 120. So they, they both show clear dominant orientations um, uh, for for the the failed interfaces, um, and the the orientation is directly uh, correlated with the orientation of the maximal principal stress on the fault, as it as is indicated by these uh, red arrows in in these diagrams. Um, going to the radiation part, we mentioned that. Uh, we saw much more high frequency radiation coming from that fractured area than uh, what we have seen in other simulations where we don't allow the, the, the material to fracture. And that's um, uh, demonstrated by this graph where if we run uh, the simulation without damage, uh, we get a spectrum uh, like the one that is shown on this figure. And uh, we, we get uh, critical frequencies for uh, far fault uh, sensors or for the near fault sensors that uh, are in the order of uh, 0.3 Hertz and one Hertz. But if we, uh, if we move to simulations with damage, the situation now changes quite dramatically in the region of uh, high frequencies. So now the spectrum that we obtain are much more, uh, it has larger amplitudes at high frequencies in comparison to the case without damage. And also the critical frequencies are shifted uh, towards a higher frequency value. So, um, and yes, the one thing to note is that uh, these higher frequencies will be quickly attenuated. But uh, in any case, the presence of this off fall damage contributes to the high frequency radiation, as we can demonstrate from our uh, simulations. So from this analysis, we have a take home messages that uh, uh, we have been able to model on and off fault multi-scale fracturing processes using the method. Uh, we observe high, high frequency radiation being enhanced by the uh, off fault damage and the contribution of the co-seismic damage to the overall energy is non neg negligible, even at depth. I haven't covered this last point here in this talk, but uh, I suggest that people that are interested on that, they can refer to the JGR paper that we published a few years ago. Okay, so now we uh, got a good uh, grasp of on how to use the method for the simulation of earthquake ruptures for ideal cases. And uh, now what happens if we want to apply the same method for a, a, a real world scenario? So we took the earthquake, uh, the 7.8 uh, magnitude Kaikura earthquake in 2016, 
and uh, as a study case, and we concentrate it on the area that is uh, highlighted or indicated by this uh, yellow square, where we have a, 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 the Jordan Fault, the Kekerengu Fault, and the Papatea Faults. Uh, so the idea was to, uh, that there were two different scenarios on uh, how the rapture was uh, evolved in time. The first scenario considered that the rapture happened on the Jor Jordan Fault and is indicated by the number one here in this figure, and then propagated further north and passed to the Papatea Fault. And the second scenario uh, considered that the rupture started on the Papatea Fault and then uh, propagated to the Jordan and Kekerengu Faults uh, later on. So the question was, which scenario is more realistic? Uh, the, um, the field of deformation after the the earthquake was uh, obtained by satellite image correlation and is shown here on the left hand side uh, figure. We have different profiles, uh, J2, K2, P2 through P5, P5, and the displacement across uh, or along those profiles which cross the faults are um, plotted on the right hand side graphs. So we see some cases where there is a very clear uh, uh, concentrated displacement uh, at the fault point, uh, like for example, J2 and K2. And there are other cases where there is a much more distributed deformation profile. And uh, uh, that is attributed to the fact that we, uh, we, we have off-fault damage uh, around the fault that allows for the material to uh, deform uh, in a wider uh, area uh, at, at each side of the faults. So we tested uh, four hypothetical scenarios. Um, we played the game by setting the off-fault damage on and off, and uh, that was combined with the two potential nucleation areas, which is one considered in Papatea first, and the other one is considered in uh, Jordan first. So this is the Jordan first scenario with off-fall damage, and uh, this is the, the animation that uh, we obtained, so the, the fault starts running from that point. And as it propagates, it creates some off-fall damage indicated by the yellow lines. When it account, encounters the Papatea fault, uh, it also propagates through that, but uh, we'll see what happens with the profiles for this case, which don't, uh, don't agree quite well with the observations. So this is the Papatea uh, first uh, scenario with off-fall damage. So now the nucleation area is here. And as we animate the, the results, we obtain a lot of damage uh, in this uh, region where the fault uh, makes a change in direction. And when the rupture ap uh, approaches the end of Papatea fault, then it, it jumps into the, the other one, into the Jordan and Kekerengu faults, and it continues propagating. So uh, the, for the cases of no damage, we obtain these profiles that are shown on the right-hand side. Oh, sorry, um, where the uh, simulation results sh uh, yield a very, very sharp change in the deformation at the fault itself. And that's to be expected because we don't have any other degree of freedom in the medium itself to accommodate uh, um, 
other type of deformation within the medium. So uh, if we move to the uh, scenario with uh, Jordan first with awful damage. So remember that for this case, the rupture started in this area where in this area where the number one indicates. Uh, the profiles we obtain are shown on the right hand side. So it's uh, better in some sense uh, for some of the profiles. Uh, for example, for uh, J2 and K2 is quite reasonable, but for the other ones, uh, P2 through P5, we don't quite capture uh, very well the, the, the formation uh, field around the sides of the fault of the Papatea fault. Now, if we go with the Papatea first scenario, which is uh, nucleation happening here where the number two is, uh, we see a much more complex uh, scheme of damage outside the fault. And when we compare the, the formation, uh, the agreement is much better than for the other two uh, uh, cases that we saw before. So. Uh, what we uh, propose is that the, the, the sequence of this uh, fault uh, uh, failure or fault uh, running was that uh, it initiated uh, in this uh, area of the Papatea, propagated north, and then uh, continued to uh, propagate through the Kekerengu and the Jordan Falls. Uh, at later times. So this is for us the most likely rupture scenario. We also compare uh, not only those profiles, but uh, if we uh, take a look at the uh, top view of the uh, diffuse deformation areas that were surveyed uh, from satellite, this is a very nice comparison of where the deformation areas were identified. And the simulations uh, have a very reasonable agreement with uh, that observation. So that's further evidence that uh, the Papatea first scenario is the most likely uh, based on the results we obtain. So um, as a conclusion, we, we can say that the cost seismic of fall damage plays a, a very important role in the high frequency radiation, in the dissipation of in the off fault medium, and in the overall energy budget. And um, uh, we could use the approach that we devised in the numerical framework that we, we created to study the deformation uh, fields associated with the real uh, rupture case and to be able to shed more light or uh, gain more insight on what may have been the sequence of events for that particular earthquake. Okay, so this is the last part of the talk. And uh, yeah, I hope uh, I'm not running too late. And, time, but uh, as a follow on on Kurama's work, uh, Dr. Carlos Villafuerte, who started a postdoc at ENS, uh, Ecole Normale Superior in Paris with Harshabat, uh, is studying the um, uh, rupture of thrust faults. And uh, that's very relevant for uh, uh, many situations or many cases where that are thrust faults very close to uh, cities or uh, areas of high population. So we use the same method, the combined final discrete element method. The setup that uh, we are analyzing is indicated by this uh, figure on the top right hand side. Uh, we have a a thrust fault that is inclined at a certain angle. For this case, it's 30 degrees, but we also analyzed a lower 
uh, angles. And we specify uh, the medium properties accordingly and uh, also the pre-existing stress or the tectonic stresses. Uh, sigma one and sigma two are imposed to the system before uh, before the simulation is run. So this is uh, the case of the thrust fault at the 30 degree deep angle. So we have the rupture starting at this point. And as the rupture propagates towards the free surface, we see that uh, the interaction between the, the rupture and the free surface creates the uh, opening of the fault and a, a permanent displacement of the right hand side uh, medium as a consequence. And what we are plotting here is uh, consider that the displacement has been exaggerated by 500 times. Uh, that's why we see such a jump, big jump, uh, but uh, it's uh, only for visualization purposes. And here on the left, we can see the uh, uh, different stages in the deformation of the medium. So the top uh, shows the counterclockwise rotation happening right before the, uh, the rupture reaches the, the surface. Uh, then we see a pitching, pinching in the toe of the hanging wall and uh, finally a torque release and flapping of the hanging wall. Um, in the case of a 10 degree deep angle, so this is what uh, happens. So we have the fault uh, that has been running uh, from the right hand side. But if we concentrate on the area where the, the fault reaches the free surface, um, this is what we observe in our results. So we have again the counterclockwise rotation and we also uh, observe a daughter crack uh, creation and super shear rupture uh, in, the mean, in the middle of the process. Uh, at the end, we, we see also a torque release and flapping of the hanging wall similar to what we observed in the previous uh, results. So this is ongoing work uh, that um, uh, Carlos is uh, conducting. We are not using of fall damage yet here because uh, uh, there is uh, many things we want to learn and uh, clarify uh, before introducing damage because that's a, a further complexity that uh, for the model. But the next step will be to uh, concentrate on, on that uh, damage area. So we observe a um, large slip and uh, fault opening uh, as we get close to the trench or close to the area where the, the fault intersects with the free surface, as is indicated by these graphs uh, where we have time and sleep, uh, non-dimensional -dim sleep on the y-axis. Um, okay, so reaching the conclusions of uh, the work that Carlos has been conducting, uh, the, um, we confirm that uh, there is a fault opening occurring in thrust faults, and uh, that it provokes a, a, an increase in the rupture as it reaches the free surface, uh, and that's also more evident for lower deep angles. Um, the fault opening, we can attribute that to the result of the torque mechanism and uh, is a consequence of the release of that torque. And the um, uh, free surface, uh, presence of the free surface introduces a considerable reduction of the normal stress and that uh, uh, it, it's a, a, a big mechanism in this, uh, in this type of problems. So in summary for the whole talk, this, uh, we have demonstrated that we can use this uh, method to uh, the simulation of earthquake ruptures. And yeah, the next steps that we have in the research path is to include the damage uh, for the 
uh, thrust faults. And uh, I would like to acknowledge and thank uh, Dr. Kurama Okubo, Dr. Carlos Villafuerte, and Dr. Harshabat for their uh, insights and collaboration during this work.